Welcome to today's webinar, It Takes One to Know One, Understanding Anxiety, Depression, and Anger in Men. My name is Emily Scahill. I'm the Manager of Public Education and Awareness at Mental Health America's National Office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. A few things I want to go over before introducing our presenter today. This webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and a copy of the slides will be emailed out to all registrants within a week. And we do not offer CEUs, but if you would like a certificate of attendance, we do have a form for you to request one. I'll post the link to that form in the chat shortly, and it'll be included in the follow-up email as well. And last but not least, we've built in some time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll go through some at the end. And feel free to make comments or share some of your knowledge in there as well. And now I'm so excited to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Kevin Chapman. Dr. Chapman is a licensed clinical psychologist and founder and director of the Kentucky Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders. He also serves as a consultant for the creation of evidence-based anxiety treatment protocols due to his additional expertise related to the intersection of multiculturalism and mental health. He serves on several editorial boards, including the Journal of Anxiety Disorders and Clinical Child and Family Psychologist Review. Dr. Chapman regularly contributes to and serves as a consultant for multiple media outlets and has been featured in US News and World Report, USA Today, NBC Health, Bloomberg Business Week, Men's Health, and numerous other outlets. He also serves as the team psychologist for the Louisville City Football Club. Dr. Chapman holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Center College, a Master of Science in Clinical Psychology from Eastern Kentucky University, and a Doctorate in Clinical Psychology from the University of Louisville. He has a lot of great information to share with you today, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Chapman to get us started. All righty, thank you, Emily, and uh, thank you guys for joining in today. And you know, I'm one that's big on titles, and there's a couple puns in this title, so I'm looking forward to sharing with you all, you know, just my knowledge in this area. I think it will be really helpful. Uh, we're going to take a really kind of bird's eye view. I don't want this to be like overly research based, but there's a lot of research components to it. I'm very conceptual, so I like to lay the table first and really talk about some basic concepts that will help us understand this very important topic. So, again, like Emily specified the title is it takes one to know one understanding anxiety depression and anger in men and you'll find what i mean by that title as we you know proceed with these slides so just like any presentation i just want to make sure that uh let's see here here we go we want to talk about various objectives here so what i hope you can take away from this is we're going to talk initially about the function when i say function i really mean the purpose of the motive right so the functions of anxiety, sadness, we'll even talk about frustration and anger because a lot of people confuse frustration and anger. Hopefully you'll be able to discern the difference and the overlap between that, those two concepts today. Um, understanding negative affect and neuroticism as a clinical psychologist is really important and an anxiety specialist in particular. We talk a lot about in our research literature about this idea of negative affect, also known as behavioral inhibition and this tendency toward neuroticism, which we'll talk about. That's really a clue in unlocking our understanding of these various concepts. And again, we'll hit the, the men and anger part later, but we have to lay the table first. And then emotional dysregulation, of course, which is really what we're talking about. Anger in men, and I put a question mark because it's a number, it's, 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 a, it's a question, right? It's like, so what is this about? What do we know about it? Like, why does it seem like it's more of an issue? And we'll talk about that. And then finally, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't have a slide that just talked about some ways to approach this topic with maybe people you work with or people that are loved ones or yourself, right? Whoever it might be a friend of a friend, you know how it goes. So we'll go into that as well. All right, so let's go. So very, very, very simple, but powerful concept is the idea of initially understanding. When we talk about it takes one to know one and then understanding anger, anxiety, frustration, depression, et cetera, any emotion really, we could fill in the blank. It's initially very important to understand what the function of any emotion is. And that tells us something very important about where we're going in this presentation. So let's define that. The whole purpose of an emotion is to alert us to what's going on around us in order to get us to do things that are helpful or useful for our survival. And so if you think about an emotion, it doesn't matter what the emotion is at the core, whether it be sadness or anxiety or fear or anger or frustration, excitement even. All of those emotions are one people don't like to talk about, of course, disgust, which we talk about a great deal in my field. <laughs> but it's to alert us to what's going on around us. So at the core, our emotions are adaptive. They're trying to help us navigate our world by telling us that something demands our attention. So we gotta start there before we really get into full detail 
about some of these other concepts. So another very important component is as we talk about emotions, we're really talking about three parts. You know, most people, when they describe emotions, they usually say things like the following, right? I feel like we should go eat at, you know, Qdoba. Well, that sounds great, but that's not a feeling. Or I feel like you shouldn't have said that to me. Like people, especially where I live, you know, really a South slash Midwest sort of area, people say that all the time and that's not a feeling. So it's really important to understand that what people mean when they say that. So we're talking about emotional experiences having three components, not one. So we're talking about thoughts, what I say to myself, feelings, quote unquote, which really describe physical sensations and then behaviors. So any emotion we experience is always gonna have those same three parts. And it's essential to recognize that anytime we're talking about any emotion, disgust, anger, sadness, et cetera, you fill in the blank of the emotion, it doesn't matter what the emotion is, it's always going to have the same three components. So, so far what we're saying is that at the core, emotions are trying to help us navigate on the one hand, and any emotion we experience on the other hand is all, always going to have three components. And that's essential to understanding how we're gonna proceed with understanding difficult experiences that many people that we know have with emotion, okay? So that's a very important seed plant for where we're going with this concept. So. In other words, what we're saying here is this. Emotions are basically lead us to respond a certain way to a perceived source of threat, right? So your emotions are saying, you're triggered by me right now because I need you to be attentive to this, right? And it's always some form of survival, right? And when we talk about life or death, sometimes we mean life or death in the sense of mortality, but not always, right? as you'll find as we proceed and talk about specific emotions, it's important to understand that when I say death, especially when I'm working with a client or doing a workshop, I don't just mean mortality. I also mean relationships, right? I also mean exams or important job interviews or the loss of a loved one. Like all of those represent some form of threat. So when we think about and broaden our understanding of what we mean by what is an emotion and the purpose it serves, we need to really understand what is it that the emotion is trying to get us to pay attention to, meaning how should we proceed and act accordingly. So that's very important as we move forward. So we're gonna get into some detail in a second about specific emotions, particularly the emotions that are the subject of this webinar, all right? So one of my favorite, and this is my area more than anything else, is anxiety, so the purpose of anxiety. So let me soapbox since I have a captive audience. Most people confuse anxiety and fear and worry, and those are not the same emotional experiences. We oftentimes use those terms interchangeably. So just to be clear, those aren't the same concepts, right? When we're talking about fear, we're talking about present danger. We're talking about fight or flight, right? We're not talking about anxiety in that case, we're talking about fear. Fear is about present danger. And you're gonna find that there's a slight difference with anxiety in that regard. Anxiety always serves an adaptive purpose at the core, right? And I like to tell people, one of my favorite quotes is that anxiety is rarely a problem unless it's chronic. And that's a very important concept, okay? So here's the purpose of anxiety. Anxiety is what we call a future-oriented emotion. It involves thoughts that contain thoughts of uncontrollability and unpredictability of things that may occur in the future, right? So it's this idea that some event that occurs in the future, not in the present moment, but in the future. Well, Kevin, what about if I'm the third person to present in a class and I'm starting to be anxious? Isn't that present? Well, if you haven't presented yet, no, that's still the future. So ultimately anxiety is preparatory coping. Preparatory coping implies that it's preparing us to deal with potential threat. So anxiety is really important to recognize that unless it's chronic and impairing my functioning, it's rarely a problem. Anxiety is most certainly helpful at the core. So keep that in mind as we move forward. So at the core, anxiety is an adaptive emotional experience. It's trying to get us to pay attention and shift our attention to future threat. And we'll get into detail about how that could go awry in a second. What about sadness? Because that's a part of this webinar as well. So sadness, and we can say depression as well, though sadness is, is essentially what I would consider 
a dysregulated form or depression is a dysregulated form of sadness, which we'll talk about. But sadness is the main emotional experience, right? That underscores depression as we know. So sadness is also adaptive though, right? And you'll find that many people view these emotions as negative. Many people view these emotions as something we want to be free from. And we'll talk about in a bit why that's a problem because these all, all of these emotions at the core are meant to help us, not harm us. So what's the purpose of sadness? Well, it's a sense of dejection, melancholy, hopelessness, and it's a natural, and I do re repeat, natural response to loss where no solutions are obvious. And that's essential to our understanding of sadness and where oftentimes we need to intervene as clinicians, but ultimately it's natural, it's normal. I think most people can agree with that. So we'll get to the, the FAQ, of course, of well, what happens when I have too much of it. Well, we'll get to that. But sadness prompts us to take a step back. Now, here's the key. When we think about most emotional experiences, the majority of our emotional experiences are all about an increase in activity. So we talk about like physiological arousal, which we won't talk a lot about today, but we'll talk about it a bit. We talk about like heightened distress and things like that. So when our bodies are mobilized with most emotional experiences, it's important that our core prepares us to deal with whatever that demand or threat is. Sadness is the opposite. It's about taking a step backwards in order for us to adequately gather our resources before moving forward. And just a sidebar, it's almost like saying, are you saying, Kevin, that I need to mourn on purpose? Are you saying that I need to think about the traumatic experience intentionally, like on purpose, as opposed to suppress it or push it away? And the short answer is absolutely yes. Well, that sounds really bad. Well, we'll get to that. But the main point I'm making there is that the key is navigating it and confronting it, right? Engaging in exposure, if you will, to the emotional experience. And that's what leads to the regulation of it, which we'll get to. But the point is though, is the sadness involves us taking a step back. That's why we don't have energy. That's why our heart rate is slow. That's why we don't wanna do a whole lot of things because sadness is designed to get us to take a step back in order to prepare us to mourn so that we can ultimately move forward. So hopefully that makes sense. That's a very important point. Okay, so that's sadness in a nutshell, also very adaptive. What is frustration? Because I know I'm the only one on this webinar who's ever experienced this, so maybe I'm just talking to myself. But when we think about frustration, frustration is a very simple definition. It really is, and I think that a lot of people will be enlightened with this because we there's some overlap with anger, and I think that we'll have some light bulb moments. Frustration is simple. It's an emotional response associated with Unmet expectations, unmet expectations. You know, I work a lot with athletes, not only from a sports performance standpoint, but even clinically as well. But then I have my clinical clients as well who struggle with anxiety and other strong emotional experiences. And it's almost like saying, if I'm playing basketball and I miss a free throw and get frustrated, my expectation is that I, didn't, I wasn't supposed to miss the free throw, but I did in fact, right? So the key is, why did I miss the free throw? So the point is, is with frustration, it's this idea that I have an expectation, whether it's unrealistic or not, that wasn't met. I spilled something earlier today when I was making some matcha lattes for the staff and at the center. So it's like, I was frustrated, but it, you know, I wasn't super salty about it. In other words, frustration is unmet expectations. I didn't expect to spill pineapple syrup, but I did, right? So it took me 20 minutes to get things situated. But the point is, is that frustration is also adaptive because it's shifting my attention to the demands of what just happened. Hopefully that makes some sense. So that's frustration, okay? So that really is a good segue into an emotion that many of us are curious about, of course, and that's anger. And what's the purpose of anger? And yes, the red is intentional. And yes, anger is adaptive. Anger, just like all the other emotional experiences we've discussed thus far, is an adaptive emotional experience. It's important, it's helping us navigate. So what's the purpose? Well, I think that it's pretty straightforward. It's an emotional response. And the key word here is perceived. Perceived intentional injury, victimization, or mistreatment. So in other words, anger's whole purpose is that if someone, either we perceive it occurring or that it actually did, prompts us to defend ourselves or our territory. And I hope that makes sense because ultimately anger is supposed to help you navigate a damaged relationship. 
or a situation where you're supposed to protect yourself. Anger and fear have quite a bit of overlap because it's about survival as well, right? So anger is most certainly about defending myself, protecting myself, protecting my loved ones or my territory. And that's an extremely important point that needs to be pointed out. So let's talk about that overlap and this will clear some things up for people. So the difference between frustration and anger, I think we made it clear, but what oftentimes happens with people who get frustrated slash irritated slash angry, it's frustration becomes anger when unmet expectations are directed toward people. And hopefully that makes sense. I gave my random, you know, non-threatening example of pineapple syrup, right? That's not directed toward anybody, right? No one made me do that, right? There's no perception that somebody magically took my hand and made me spill pineapple syrup. But if there is a direct target, so to speak, and my unmet expectations involve someone else, then that's when anger become, can become problematic and frustration can cross over into the area of anger. Sidebar again, remember what we said already, all emotional experiences have three components. And therefore, since all emotional experiences have three components, obviously there's a, there's a thinking component to this, which we'll get to in a bit, but I just wanna plant the seed that this doesn't magically occur. There's a process involved with frustration becoming anger. All right, so that's a very important point. Okay, so to simplify, Many of, many of us who like images and think in pictures, this is an example. So here's the functions we talked about. So anxiety, again, focus attention on possible sources of keyword future threat. If anxiety had words, y'all, it would say the following. It would say, I don't know if this event will happen again or not, but I have to be prepared just in case, right? Anxiety prompts this hypervigilance and preparedness for something that hasn't actually occurred yet. Sadness, the focus of attention, is on mourning and gathering resources so that we can process whatever that loss is. It could be a loved one, it could be a job. If I'm an athlete, it could be like a, a, a game, uh, the end of my career, things like that. And then of course, anger, the focus of attention is on defending oneself or a loved one against a threat. So I hope you see that theme, okay? And, if I, and the only seed plan I'll say at this point is remember the title, okay? Because it's important to understand that there's significant overlap across these emotional experiences, which we'll get to as we continue to set the table. So that's just kind of a, uh, an, an example from an imagery perspective so you can see what I mean. Okay, so the very important segue. So if these emotions are adaptive, why do people struggle with managing these emotions? That's, a, that's an excellent question. It's a question that we should ask and it's a question that needs to be answered. So is saying you're saying that at the core these emotions are meant to help me navigate and yet many people that we interact with experience emotions on a regular basis at a much more inflated level right it's like you know you're staying angry or you're constantly anxious or you seem more sad than you need to be it's things like that now here's kind of the drum roll statement one reason that people who struggle with strong emotional experiences do is because of our understanding of the role of what we call neuroticism. And neuroticism, a colleague of mine, um, her book, I think it literally was released today, and I'm looking forward to it, but neuroticism is a very important construct. It's a temperament factor that basically says that some people are genetically predisposed to experience negative emotions more frequently and intensely. So think about that. That's saying, that genetically speaking, there are some people that just have what I like to tell my clients, they have big feelings, right? It's just that if I get anxious, I'm big anxious, right? If I get excited even, I'm big excited. If I'm you know, angry or mad, I'm big mad, right? Or big sad, whatever it might be. So what happens is that that tendency toward neuroticism is a risk factor, which sets me up for others, which we'll talk about in a second. And that can be a major culprit in why you see one person who has the same exact direct experience in an environment versus someone else who has the same experience and yet one reacts way over the top, if you will, more so than the other person. And what we know about emotional disorders is that neuroticism is a significant, significant risk factor in the development of a whole host of emotional disorders, right? Anxiety disorders, depression, and so on and so forth. So neuroticism is a very important construct to consider as we move forward, which oftentimes tells us, 
and separates why some people struggle with certain emotional experiences versus other people. So neuroticism. Now, so with that being said, so what happens with people now, you know, who struggle with these emotions that are in too, in too intense for the situation? So what we know is this, people who struggle with what we call emotional disorders, they experience these, these core emotions we just talked about in what we call a dysregulated fashion. In other words, I experience sadness or anger or anxiety in a way that is way too intense for the situation. That's extremely dysregulated. It's my regulation or ability to manage those emotions tends to be the biggest issue, right? So I experience those core emotions, those same emotions that we've already established as important and helpful for our navigation of environments. We experience those emotions in a dysregulated way. In other words, I'm experiencing too much or the emotion is too intense, right? So essentially what we're saying is this, here's the bottom line. When we think about anxiety, sadness, or depression and anger, individuals who struggle with these emotions, they ultimately respond to these emotions in a way that provides them with temporary relief, but there's a paradox. That relief is short lived because it ultimately backfires and contributes to more of that emotional experience, right? So it's this idea that many people, it's their response to emotions that perpetuate them, right? In other words, the more I try to push anxiety away, to use a pretty common example, the more anxious I become later, even though I received a bit of relief, right? Uh, worry is a good response to that because worry uh, speaks to that point. Worry gives me the impression that I'm problem solving. So if I worry in response to anxiety, I get the sense that I'm problem solving, but worry backfires it makes me more anxious for other reasons we could talk about on a different webinar. But the point is though, is that I'm responding to emotions in ways that seem to give me a sense of relief, but it backfires and leads to the perpetuation of these emotional experiences. That's the issue that we're facing. And that explains largely what we're seeing in many people that we work with, uh, maybe ourselves or people that we care about. And that's a very important concept. So here's a really, really basic, but good example. So I have an upcoming exam for, right, for instance. So I get anxious, you know, I, and rather than focusing on what the anxiety's function is. So say the exam, there's an exam. So the anxiety is saying, the reason I'm revving you up and reducing your activity to shift it to this future threat of this exam is so that you can do what? To study. But if I'm someone who struggles with the emotion of anxiety and I experience it and say intensely, again, I know I'm the only person on here that's ever procrastinated, then ultimately what I find is that one way to respond to that anxiety that I have found helpful seemingly is to procrastinate. Now, now notice this, procrastination leads to a sense of relief initially, but ironically it backfires and it leads to more long-term anxiety, not to mention probably not doing that well on the exam, probably feeling ashamed, probably feeling like I'm a failure, but the next time I get triggered, I go back to what seemed to work and then I do it again, at least to some relief again, but it backfires and makes me more anxious. It's a vicious cycle of simply trying to feel better in ways that backfire and make me feel worse. That is the best explanation is that I'm simply trying to feel better in ways that actually make me feel worse. And you see the other example is that anxiety is really telling me you need to study to avoid failing, right? I study, of course, I don't feel like studying, so I'm anxious initially, but notice what I did in, instead. I managed the threat by passing the exam, and I reduced my anxiety, and that's really interesting because this is a really common example that we all, I know, can relate to, but this is precisely what I'm saying, and granted, when we think about emotions like anger and things like that, we can see that there's more social, socially destructive consequences to that. But the function of my response to say anger, which we'll talk about, is the same. It's to do something that seems to give me some relief, but it backfires and makes me feel worse. And that's an extremely important piece to take away. So let's talk about what we call vulnerability mechanisms. All right. So what are vulnerability mechanisms? Well, neuroticism is one. Some colleagues of mine, Frank and Davidson, they have a, a really nice book. It's called a, The Transdiagnostic Roadmap to Case Formulation. It's a phenomenal book. If you're a clinician, I would recommend you get it. 
because it explains these mechanisms very well. So vulnerability mechanisms basically are risk factors, right? They're genetic predispositions that contribute to emotional disorders, right? So it's the thing that sets us up, so to speak, to be hypersensitive to certain emotional experiences. So it represents, in some cases, deficits in brain function and psychophysiology, right? Excuse me, but also learning experiences, like conditioning, conditioned experiences, things that I've actually experienced in my environment. And vulnerability mechanisms lead to various responses. So just know that vulnerability mechanisms are things that set us up, so to speak, to have more of a propensity to have, say, a response to a strong emotion, all right? That's a very important concept, and you'll see why in a second. I'll give you some examples. So here's some examples of some empirically supported vulnerability mechanisms. So, you know, pick these out, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift in a second and start talking about how these contribute to emotional experiences like anger, right? And we talk about anger in men, and we'll get to that, but ultimately, these are good examples. So we got this idea of arousal regulation and inhibitory control. So this idea that many people who struggle with emotional disorders struggle with regulating, right, in their limbic system and such, and therefore can engage in impulsive action tendencies, right? So it's this idea that I have a hard time regulating my behavioral experience, right? Emotional regulation, same concept in that way. It's hard for me to regulate or temper down my emotional experience. Distress tolerance, my ability to be uncomfortable, right? Can I tolerate having strong arousal in my body, right? Informational processing, another risk factor. Many people are predisposed to process information in a really threatening way. We often talk about anxious clients having what we call a threat bias. It's like I lock in to the one person who seems to be scowling at me during my presentation who may have had bad food the night before. When in reality, 900 people are watching and going, shaking their head and nodding and smiling and giving me really good feedback. But there's a bias that I've adopted to only pay attention to the threat cues, negative schema, same concept. So it's this idea that I have these thinking patterns and experiences in a very fixed world view of how I view myself as well as other people. Negative problem orientation, right? Identifying only the negative facets of outcomes, right? It's like, the glass is half empty, right? That sort of vibe, perceived control disability or this perception that I can't control, right? Outcomes, but not only that, that I don't have a lot of control, so I lack it. And then of course, conditioned learned associations, like things that have actually happened to me, right? Some experiences that I've had in my environment that set me up, so to speak, to think a certain way or to have certain arousal and emotional experiences in different contexts. So that's also very important. So these are known deficits and risk factors. Um, so let's talk about the other side of the coin and that's what we call response mechanisms. And response mechanisms are also important because these are basically the patterns of, that are activated in response to the other mechanisms we just talked about. So these response mechanisms or responses are like feedback loops. It's this idea that, you know, it, contributes to the worsening of a problem. So it reinforces and contributes to this feedback loop. It's almost like saying, if you were to say, oh, so-and-so is a hothead, right? This is idea, it's because they respond to certain things that are happening around them in a consistent fashion, thus calling them a hothead, right? It's like, I have a hard time, nobody's gonna walk around and say, oh, you know, Pete has problems with behavioral inhibition and therefore, who's gonna say that, right? But in theory, that's what's happening. It's this idea that Pete may be responding to this context a certain way, but in reality, it could be anxiety. Another conversation. Response mechanisms are defining characteristics of emotional disorders. So some examples that we're well aware of, avoidance equals like anxiety disorders. We see avoidance quite a bit with anxiety and related disorders. We see rituals or compulsions, right? Within OCD, those are responses. We see, and this is important for where we're going in a second, an attributional bias, right? Attacking other people, blaming other people for something that they didn't in fact do and it's I'm responsible, but therefore my MO, if you will, is that it's your fault, right? And that's very important for what we're gonna talk about because I have a theory about that. All right, so here's three big ones for anger. So again, there's others, but to simplify, I think that as we proceed, it's important to kind of think about what are some of the mechanisms that we often see with people who struggle particularly with anger and their responses to anger, whether it be justified or not, 
in terms of the threat itself, the response might be over the top. So one is what we call cognitive misappraisal. It's this idea that many people have this thinking bias or this fixed way of viewing situations. We often talk about this clinically with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what we, we do here. And this idea that cognitive misappraisal is that I'm misappraising or interpreting what's actually happening, right? So for instance, people who struggle with cognitive misappraisals, especially with anger or anxiety or what have you, they have what's called thinking errors or thinking traps that lock them in to only one view, right? So the thought itself isn't bad. That's not the issue. The problem with cognitive misappraisal is that thoughts are restricting what emotions I experience in a given situation. For, for example, and I'll give another example in a minute, but a hypothetical example would be if I said that this always happens to me. Well, if you think about that logically, nothing always happens to anyone. Now I'll give you that something might happen frequently, but to say something always happens or I never get a break, notice the black and white tone. That's what we call a cognitive misappraisal, right? Externalizing is another response mechanism. It's this idea that I'm attacking other people. It's your fault, right? The reason I said that to you is because of what you said to me, right? Like I responded to you because of the way you looked at me, right? I'm feeling this way because of you right? That's a good one. That's a big one, right? And that's not possible either. But nonetheless, externalizing or attacking other people is another one I want you to just take note of for anger. And then, of course, what we call an emotion-driven behavior. And that's, an, that's a basically a behavioral response. That's my MO. It's my calling card, if you will, how I react to the emotion itself. Now, as I said earlier, behaviors are a part of the emotion themselves. But emotion-driven behaviors would be, here's a good example, it'd be like escape if I'm having a panic attack at a supermarket, right? It would be like self-harm if I have struggles with strong emotional experiences. It would be isolation if, you know, I feel depressed in the moment. It would be binge eating. It would be these various things that I do in response to an emotion. So keep those three in mind as we proceed, because I think it will make some sense when we kind of connect the dots. All right, so here's an example, all right? So it's kind of like saying how these risk factors and responses may manifest in an individual. So just to be simple, like we could have put more ovals up here, these constructs, but just for the sake of understanding some of the ones we've mentioned, if you think about someone who struggles and has these vulnerability mechanisms, like they have a hard time with inhibitory control, they don't regulate emotions well, it's kind of a genetic thing, they process information in a sort of threatening way, their distress tolerance is really, really low. In other words, I do not like being uncomfortable. When I'm uncomfortable, I'm just gonna blow a gasket, right? So I gotta do something. You know people who are like, oh, I gotta move around. Like I just gotta be doing something, right? And it's like, no, that's not true. What they're really saying to you is that they have a hard time with distress tolerance, right? Being uncomfortable, right? So let's say that that's someone. It oftentimes manifests by these cognitive misappraisals Interoceptive avoidance, by the way, basically what that is, is it like basically trying to avoid the physical sensations associated with emotions. Like if my body temperature rises or my heart palpitates or if I have stomach distress or my breathing is shallow, right? The physical sensations are the experiences of emotions. That's what we call interoceptive avoidance, like trying to push that away or, oh, I can't drink caffeine because it makes me feel panicky. That's an example. So if you use these examples and see the risk factors, and then you add the response mechanisms, you can see this manifestation of what we could consider, say, anger problems, right? It's this idea that if I'm set up to feel a type of way, that leads me to think about things a type of way because I'm used to doing that. And then that can manifest through me having what we would consider, right, in kind of lay terms, anger problems. It's much deeper than that, but I think you understand the point. So that's a really good way to try to connect those dots to kind of see the point of that. So here's an example. So let's say somebody gets triggered. It could be, I don't know, being cut off in traffic because that, that's never happened, right? So somebody cuts me off in traffic. Now remember, anger, anger has three parts, just like disgust has three parts. It could go something like this. Thoughts, you know, are you freaking kidding me? Who do you think you are, right? Just really upset and salty about it. Physical sensations, of course, of anger would go along with this, like increased body temperature, muscle tension, heart palpitations, shortness of breath. And keep in mind what we said on the previous slide. If I'm already hypersensitive to this sort of arousal, 
then that's going to lead me over time to try to regulate that arousal a certain way, right? This is what we call dysregulated anger. So my behavioral response could be a many, many different things, right? The, the kind of the cartoon vibes with the at symbol and the hashtag is like, oh, I'm going to throw something or I'm going to give you a piece of my mind or I might be physically aggressive. Well, in theory, that leads that person to have a sense of relief. But it always backfires and leads to more anger. And I think that this might be the T slide because I think ultimately, if we can recognize how this cycle works, then we'll see how these problems manifest and what they're really, really about at the core. So this leads to more anger, not to mention the other negative consequences that are the result of this sort of dysregulated presentation of anger, such as damaged relationships, such as potentially, I don't know, getting assaulted, such as holding the numbers up on a police lineup, such as, right, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, depending on the context. If it's a teen, it could be suspended, losing friendships, so on and so forth. But I think you see the point of this, and I think that that's a good illustration. All right. So what about in men? So emotional dysregulation in men, and here's where we get into the, it takes one to know one. And I think that what I mean by that, obviously, you know, I'm a, um, a male, a cis male in particular. And with that being said, it's also, I'm trying to emphasize the point here too, that the title is also saying that it also takes you to understand not just that, but also the other emotional experiences that overlap with anger. Because once you understand the other emotional experiences, it begins to make some sense what the culprit is, right? So when we say things like that are pejorative, like, oh, you got anger issues. Well, my manifestation is dysregulated, right? But nonetheless, that doesn't in and of itself mean that anger is the culprit. So one source I wanted to draw from, I did an interview with the Wall Street Journal in 2019 on this piece. And it says, anxiety looks different in men Instead of coming across as nervous or worry, anxiety in men often appears anger, muscle aches, or alcohol use, leading many men to go undiagnosed, and that is facts, right? So ultimately, I would encourage you to, uh, to check, check this out because there's a lot of really good quotes and such in this, but we're going to highlight some of those. And basically, the title of the article is, and men anxiety can often look different. Let's talk about that, and here's what we know. All right, so when we think about emotional dysregulation in men, and think about anger and how it often manifests, we often see, and this is a quote from the article that I had, and that is men often present, you know, as these loose cannons, so to speak, if you want to call it that, but oftentimes they struggle with chronic worry, right? Which interestingly enough, worry is what we do as a byproduct in response to anxiety, but oftentimes it's manifesting in a way that looks socially destructive. So aggression, historically, right, has been this idea of this more socially accepted uh, perspective based on kind of historical gender role socialization. It's like, oh, well, you know, it's okay for a man to be angry, which in fact is not true, but ultimately that's how many people are socialized. One in five men often are or diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, but it's often underreported, right? Because when you see the presentation of aggressive or something along those lines, you're looking in the wrong place. We're thinking that they must have some sort of impulse control problem, which partially that's true if you've been listening, but ultimately it could be something else. And we know that anxiety and depression co-occur and many men engage in many different things, in different ways to try to regulate their emotional experiences. So alcohol abuse is one of those ways to regulate emotions. I wanna be clear about that. So we know that alcohol abuse and dependence can have devastating consequences, right? But keep in mind the function, the function or the purpose of that alcohol use oftentimes is the same function as procrastination with anxiety. It just has far worse consequences. Does this make sense? So understand that it's me trying to feel better in ways that are backfiring and perpetuating these dysregulated emotional experiences, right? So again, also most men in society are socialized to view vulnerability as a weakness, right? We got this idea of this hyper-masculinity. We have sports culture that often perpetuates these stereotypes and things along those lines. So oftentimes that causes a lot of people to say, well, I have to internalize. And therefore, if I manifest any of these, say, these symptoms that I'm experiencing as dysregulated, then it's going to be a problem, right? And ultimately what it's doing is that it's building up and manifesting in ways that can be completely devastating in many cases. So most men often tend to seek treatment following a crisis, 
or after urging from a partner, right? Now, I know plenty of self-aware people who come in for the same reasons that anybody else would, but typically from a research standpoint, that's what we often see. It's more of this, this urging from someone else, which is ironic because if you recall from what I said earlier, that externalizing or that blame, right? It's like, no, well, they made me come. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. So what do we do with that? So some, some strategies to consider here, right? Is this idea. Number one, what we find, and this is also in the article that I, that I mentioned, is avoid ultimatums. So if we're trying to help someone, um, a male in particular, who is struggling with what appears to be anger or what appears to be anxiety, or what appears to be depression, we have to avoid ultimatums. So that can increase resistance and what we know in our literature, especially like in couples work, what we call stonewalling. It's like defensiveness, shutting down. I'm not talking to you about it. You're not safe to talk about talk to about this or therefore kind of like cold shoulder don't even talk to me and that's often something that we've seen plenty of times so avoid ultimatums because that will definitely enhance the idea of stonewalling number two and this is a good one this is very subtle all right and this is very powerful and i see this often frame the potential of therapy as a way to increase performance and pleasure and what i mean by that is what i call an athlete mentality i oftentimes have men see me in treatment for something they call something completely differently, right? Like I wanna enhance my performance, right? I wanna be more of a go-getter at work sort of vibes. When in reality, you chronically worry, right? But it takes a good relationship and rapport to really have someone speak that into someone, but also for them to receive it as what it is, right? So that's very important. It's gonna to come to another point, point number four in a second, but frame it as this idea of increasing your performance and pleasure, right? Like you wanna enjoy life more, right? So therefore, all right, number three, express your own distress about theirs. This idea of like, I'm just not sleeping seeing you like this, right? Like I'm worried sick about you, right? Compassion is so incredibly important because again, whether we like it or not, many men are socialized to internalize that stuff, not manifest any sign of we, oh, I don't cry, you know, things like that. And that's absolutely absurd. These are all normal emotional experiences that all of us manifest and experience. So therefore it's important that we're very compassionate about it and approach it in that fashion. Number four to me is extremely important and that is avoiding labels. Many people are hypersensitive in, in general to diagnostic labels. Um, I oftentimes talk about emotional experiences and the disordered experience or dysregulated emotional experience by not using labels. I'm using the exact same terminology that we're talking about. This idea of you're just simply trying to feel better in ways that backfire and make you feel worse. Anyone that I say that to, they're like, yeah, how'd you know? That's exactly what it is. I couldn't put my finger on it. Rather than you got anger problems, right? You're a nervous wreck. Like these sort of stigmatizing pejorative terms will turn people away. And it, oh, by the way, is not a great way to build rapport. But ultimately, the diagnostic label helps us clinically, right? In terms of what sort of treatment plan and conceptualization we might utilize. But it holds little value unless, you know, for obviously for many clients, it does in the sense that it's like, oh, that's what that is. But ultimately, I find that it's a powerful rapport building tool to simply talk about the manifestations, the, me the mechanisms and the symptoms as opposed to saying, well, you have blank. That's a part of your identity. Right. So so keep that in mind, avoiding labels. And then finally, um, I would say seeking a therapist who particularly engages in cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT, CBT and other forms of CBT is the gold standard for emotional disorder symptoms. There's other very effective treatment methods for anxiety and related disorders in particular, depression, mild forms in particular, and other conditions, CBT most certainly is a very powerful way to teach you to be your own therapist, so to speak, in a very collaborative, real world oriented sort of way. So, so I will stop there and I think that Emily you will be pleased because on my watch it says 345 let's go. <laughs> yeah, perfect timing. Thank you for sharing so much great information um, and we've got plenty of time for Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so if you have questions go ahead and send them through the chat box and we already have a bunch to get us started. Um, so first off do anxiety depression and anger look different in men of varying races and cultures and if so what are the differences? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, ultimately what we find is that yes and no. So ultimately it looks pretty consistent. I think what we find is that 
the manifestations are pretty similar, but the terminology we often use is a little bit different. So in other words, based on enculturation, which is what we talk about when we talk about people of color in that literature, is this idea of how I'm socialized to my culture of origin, right? Like how do I socialize to my, in my racial identity? Oftentimes that is a factor that will contribute to how I manifest and even the semantics and terms that I use. But ultimately the dysregulation that we experience, despite whatever the culture may be, Oftentimes it's going to manifest in consistent ways, but the way I describe it is what we find from a sociocultural standpoint that often changes depending on not only my own racial identity, but also you know, what it is and who, who I'm manifesting it around and what I've learned in that environment in particular. Great. Um, looking at a younger age group, are these principles and strategies um, still relevant to younger boys? Absolutely, and I think that you know, Emily, I'm much more in a, a preventative frame of mind. And I think it's really important because whether we like it or not, there's definitely still gender stereotypes and socialization problems. And I think ultimately, when we talk about being preventative, we need to talk about this early, especially with younger boys, because all of these emotions are adaptive. Not trying to internalize these emotions and explaining and having a safe space. If I'm a caregiver or a family member or a loved one, it's extremely important, especially when you're socializing any child, to give them a safe space to talk about emotions early so that they know that there's not something that I have to try to push away and suppress because ultimately it's gonna backfire anyway and lead to stronger emotional experiences. So absolutely, yes, it's the same sort of terminology, but I think the key is using developmentally appropriate language and also creating that safe space to talk about emotions. Great point. Yeah, creating that space early, early on in kids' lives goes a long way. Um, what are some tips or suggestions to give family members or significant others on how to handle their loved one's angry outburst? How can you help someone without upsetting them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that that's where this slide is super important. And, and I had that in mind as I talked about this. So again, when we're talking about a dangerous situation, I get ultimatums. That's, I get that. But when we're talking about more so the compassionate approach, I think it's more so you know, I'm always about having hard conversations with people despite who they may be when things are in a smooth space. So in many ways, it's this idea of expressing how I'm feeling about the emotional experiences that you're manifesting, right? So it's this idea that I'm compassionate. It seems like to me that here's the terminology I like, Emily, is this idea that it seems like to me you're responding to emotions in ways that probably provide you with relief. I know that your anger gets built up. It's normal to feel that way but I'm guessing that it leads to more anger, right? You're just trying to feel better. I understand why you yell, or I understand why you, you know, say this to them and regret it later, because you're just simply trying to feel better in ways that isn't working. Does that sound accurate to you? So like becoming kind of a bench psychologist in that way, and then they're gonna say yes, because that's exactly why they're having the difficulties they're having to begin with. So I think the main thing is, again, creating a safe space to talk about it. Talk about it when anger's not high, and also expressing that compassion and not labeling. Like those are so incredibly important. Great, and a question from a mother of three boys um, who told her that they don't always want her to solve the conflict, they just want her to listen, which is really hard for her as a fixer. Do yep. you have any advice on dealing with anger in that kind of context? Yeah, that's really interesting because I think that there's some wisdom in what those boys are saying. I think in many ways that's more of a, to mom, <clears throat> That means you have to go in prepared when you have those conversations. So many times when we go into those conversations with our children, we're not preparing in advance. We don't have any kind of like dress rehearsal. But one of the things we talk a lot in CBT is this idea of preparing to confront uncomfortable situations in advance. So I think, mom, what probably needs to happen is you need to take a step back, right? Do some breathing exercises, but also go into the situation flexibly with a mantra of some sort like, I'm going to listen and let them talk. Literally, well, figuratively, sitting on my hands when I'm having this interaction with my sons and letting them literally talk and then say nothing. Give them affirmative head nods and things like that. And when it seems as if they're done talking, they can say, is there anything else that you'd like to share? And then see what happens. You'll see magic occur. <laughs> so I would say preparing in advance for that situation is key. And literally, they're giving you some low-hanging fruit. I absolutely would do what they said. Um, 
a question about narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. Um, are those underreported or underdiagnosed, and how do they fit into the the conversation around anger? That's, that's a terrific question, Emily. I think that they're um, I, are they underdiagnosed? Well, that that's tricky. Uh, I think oftentimes we throw those terms around, and we say that people who are manifesting various behaviors have those diagnoses when they in fact don't. So there's one way to look at it. On the other hand, men in general underreport a lot of things, <laughs> right? And oftentimes inflate a whole lot of the other things like income or various things, all sort of research studies support all these notions. But to that point, I think that what we do know is that like NPD, narcissistic personality and borderline, et cetera, those are pervasive manifestations of many of the concepts that we're talking about in this webinar, right? We're talking about people who struggle with neuroticism. We're talking about people who have a very hard time with distress tolerance and inhibitory control. We're talking about executive functioning. We're talking about high anxiety sensitivity. We're talking about negative schema, right? The list goes on and on and on. So, and I, and I think the reason I like that question is because I think it's conducive to the point I'm trying to make throughout this webinar, Emily, and that is despite what we call it, labels are helpful for us particularly, and it's helpful for many people who struggle with symptoms and they can't put their finger on it. But I think ultimately when we start understanding the underlying core issue that leads to different manifestations like narcissism or like, panic disorder with agoraphobia or whatever it may be, it gives us a better way to view and navigate dysregulated symptoms as opposed to the label per se. Great, and a related question. Um, someone mentioned that they use a lot of psychoeducation on disorders with their clients. So it, with their male clients, they're wondering if it's setting them up for failure as it relates to the concept of labeling. That's a, that's a great question. And I think that, I don't think so. I think whoever's, whoever's asking about psychoeducation, bravo, you know, you're, you're a family member of mine, right? So this is good because I'm huge into psychoed. I think that's essential, right? Especially, especially from a CBT perspective. But psychoeducation is important. I don't think that it's misleading for you to continue doing that. I think what we're saying is perhaps insert some other forms of psychoeducation and start expanding how you potentially talk about it with certain clients. So I think thinking about mechanisms, I assure you, like, I, like in my experience clinically, I've not met a single client, like, and I'm not exaggerating, that when I explain many, much of this content we're talking about, who had a negative reaction to it. Like, under, like removing the veil of these diagnostic labels and talking about mechanisms and manifestations talking about neuroticism because neuroticism in and of itself has a negative pejorative tone like oh you're neurotic well it just means you have big feelings right you experience big emotions and people can resonate or in my slang vibe with the idea that they experience strong emotions right so it's essential to continue doing that but i think adding in right these response and vulnerability mechanisms and i think you'll see like a light bulb go off and maybe even enhance rapport with certain people Right. Um, is stonewalling or emotional numbness or shutdowns caused by anger, are those common in men? And how would you recommend dealing with that? That's really ironic. Stonewalling and shout out to the mom who asked uh, the question earlier. I think that number one, that's how you deal with it. You deal with it by not providing a sense of advice or discounting of experience, but sitting on hands and providing a safe space to have the conversation with the, the male you're talking about in particular. So I think that those young men that she was talking about her sons, I think that that's low hanging fruit. So that's part of it. And secondly, 100% yes, 500 exclamation points. Stonewalling, stonewalling is definitely something that is quite common in relationships with men and, and their partners. So I think that when we talk about stonewalling, we're definitely talking about, I mean, granted, others are, you know, can stonewall as well, but we really are talking about men are much more high in frequency with stonewalling. It's a defense mechanism. It's a response to, you know, feeling attacked and things like that. And it's a way to, to shut down the conversation. So you break down that wall by not trying to break down that wall. So allowing that safe space to have that conversation and to not judge and discount the experience. That's key. That's huge. Um, mental health carries a lot of stigma in prison culture. Do you have any tips for getting better buy-in with men who are incarcerated? Yep. And I think that, and I know that I'm repeating myself, Emily, but that to me is a good thing. But I think that, yes, 
I think that in that context, I think, again, removing labels is essential. I think talking about emotional regulation is essential. I think talking about, like I mentioned, procrastination and alcohol abuse or drug abuse, right? Again, societally, we have different consequences. From an emotional perspective, they serve the same purpose, though. So I think as we talk about this idea of how I'm responding to emotions as a culprit, and that can be reprogrammed, right? We can learn new ways to respond to emotions. We can target those vulnerability and response mechanisms. I think even in a prison culture, talking about it that way and building mental toughness is what we talk about with athletes in particular. I think that that's a way to really have that conversation, building mental toughness. Great, and we've got just three minutes left. So I'm gonna ask the big question now, um, book recommendations related to <laughs> anger, related to cultural compassion, um, anything that you would recommend people take a look at for more information on this topic? Oh, man. Well, one book I really like, um, I actually have it on my, my, my shelf as we speak, uh, by Rochelle Frank and Joan Davidson is really good. Um, it's called The Transdiagnostic Roadmap to Case Formulation and Treatment Planning. That's very good. I think it talks about mechanisms very well in that book. Um, Shannon Zauer, Dr. Shannon Zauer, Zavala, home, my homegirl, down the road on 64 East. She just had a book that came out about neuroticism and I can't wait to get my hands on it. I bought it like three months ago, but it's just now dropping. So that's another powerful one because again, all of these are talking about what we've learned over the years in terms of like research and stuff, such and how we're getting away from like really focusing on labels and being less stigmatizing and talking more about these response mechanisms and the things that set people up. And I think that those are really two good ones. Excellent. And I lied. One last question. Where can people find you online? Okay. So several places. So I definitely am a social media psychologist. So you'll find me easily on social media. Uh, Dr. Kevin Chapman on Instagram at Dr. K Chap. K Chap's my nickname from sports. I played sports in college. Oh, hey, K Chap. So you can call me K Chap if you want. So on Twitter, it's at Dr. K Chap. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as um, L Kevin Chapman. And drkevinchapman.com is my, my personal website. And then KY Cards, so it's the Kentucky Center for Anxiety and Related Disorder, kycards.com is my center website. So you can find me. Excellent. And we're just about at four o'clock, so we'll wrap there. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapman, for sharing such valuable information with us today. I'll be Thank in touch you. with everyone in the next few days with the recording, the slides, and that link to request your certificate of attendance. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great week. Thank you all.